Welcome, students, residents, faculty, and our honored guest, Dr. Mark Henderson. My name is Derek Bays, and this is Tiffany Wynn, and we are part of the UC Davis Gold Humanism Honor Society chapter. The Gold Humanism Honor Society is a student-run organization recognizing individuals who excel in humanistic patient care while also serving as a role model, mentor, and leaders in medicine. This is the second annual last lecture series here at UC Davis inspired by Professor Randy Pausch's book, The Last Lecture, which he wrote in reflection on his own last lecture following a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. We've invited Dr. Henderson here to give a talk addressing the question, if this was your last opportunity to speak to young doctors and medical students, what would you like them to know? Dr. Henderson is currently Professor of Clinical Medicine and Vice Chair for Education of Internal Medicine here at UC Davis. In 2007, he was also appointed Associate Dean of Admissions for UC Davis School of Medicine. Dr. Henderson graduated from UCSF School of Medicine and completed his internal medicine residency and chief residency at University of Texas Health Center. He's also a formal, for, former internal medicine residency program director here at UC Davis. He is a highly regarded clinician educator and leader in internal medicine education, acting as a role model to medical students and physicians alike. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Dr. Henderson a warm welcome. Okay, so I'm going to try this mic. How's the volume? Is that okay? Now, we don't have a clicker, so I'm going to walk back and forth between the computer here. So when Tiffany et al. asked me to give this talk, I, 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 I looked at this prompt, which is pretty, if you would like to speak to young doctors, what would you like them to know? So I assume from that that I'm an old doctor. <laughs> now, um, and, but I'm going to take that as a compliment, so as old in the w sense of wise. So I'm going to modify this to say, what would, you, what would I tell you guys that you will actually remember? Okay, um, now so we have to talk a little bit about what people remember. And so the limits, there's a limit to short-term memory. Most people estimate that somewhere between five and nine words, so seven plus or minus two. If you use related words, it's probably better. And if there's some type of meaning or associated emotion associated with something that you say, people are more likely to remember it. So the bottom line is, Short and sweet is the best way to actually tell you something that you'll remember. So I initially started off trying to make this a 20 minute talk. However, it's gonna be longer than that, so I apologize. So you might not remember the last 20. Um, now you may hate cliches by definition, you actually tend to remember them. So I'm gonna use cliches. Here's the first one. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Now do you know who said this? Anybody? Who? Yeah, very good. Uh, we, most people think Newton said this. Um, these are these. Are, this is not Isaac Newton's. My my son Paul and my father. Um, I think that my for me when I think of standing on the shoulders of giants, I think of the people who've allowed it to be possible for me to be here. And and I consider my dad, who was an orphan, had no real education, was in foster care most of his childhood to be a, a real inspiration for me. So I wanted to show you who he was. It was Isaac Newton who originated this phrase, um, which I find amazing. This is how, what he said, actually. You can see, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then, finding a smoother pebble or prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. That's Isaac Newton, right? The, you know, just the guy who discovered gravity and a number of other things, he says that. And so I think that that, it actually turns out when you look into this, he, it was probably said by others before him, but it's attributed to him. Um, that's humility. So I thought I would, I, I thought I'd do Jeopardy questions too, because people kind of remember those. I don't know if there are any audio files, and that you're not gonna, this would be a 500 point question, but does anybody recognize the song?
it's got the standing on the shoulders of giants in there. So you get the theme. Um, huh? No, uh, that's a good guess for me. You <laughs> <laughs> No, this is oh, this is about nineteen eighty six, so it's maybe it's it gets too it's too early and it's too it's too hard. This is R. E. M. Do you guys know who R. E. M. is? This is from the album Document. So standing on the shoulders of giants. I, I was going to try to play it, but I'm not that savvy, that technically savvy. My second cliche is the secret to patient care is caring for the patient. And you know who said that? <laughs> who? Uh, no, Francis Peabody said that. <laughs> I would say, I'll tell you, I, I, it's, it, it's caring for the patient, but it's also caring about learning. Now, Francis Peabody said this really well, so I'm not going to try to paraphrase it. He wrote a book in the early thir- 20s about patient care. And if you, this is just a quote from that book. Time, sympathy, and understanding must be lavishly dispensed, but the reward is to be found in the personal bond, which forms the greatest satisfaction in the practice of medicine. One of the essential qualities of a clinician is interest in humanity, for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Now, um, I think a lot of times what we focus on and what we think about when we think about medical school is um, is is not necess- is basically filling up our brains with a lot of knowledge. We think that that's really what's going to help us take care of patients. You know, facts, formulas, skills, procedures. But I think when you when it boils down to it, all of the things that you have to learn. There's too much to learn. It's actually it's impossible to learn it all, and and because of that, I think you you have to start from a place where you know that there will always be things that you don't know, and so then what happen, What becomes more important is actually caring enough to know when you don't know to find out what you don't know, and so this is an old old painting from the uh, from the late 19th century. And I think that this, remember, this is prior to the, to the advent of antibiotics. This was a time where you couldn't really treat much as a physician. So people died of routine infection all the time, bacterial infection, but, you know, antibiotics were not available. Um, and you, if you look at this painting, I think what you see is the doctor, this is the doctor, is mostly just sitting there thinking. <laughs> Back at this time, I think all you could do as a physician was care for a patient. I mean, there really wasn't anything else to do. It's sort of interesting and ironic to me that you know now I think a lot of times we think there's all these other things to do, but oftentimes really all we need to do is again care. That's it's sometimes neglected. Um, now the the other thing I like about this painting is is he's reflecting and you can tell he's in deep thought, which I think is something that's important if you want to be the best physician you can be. It's just to keep thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, I think I said this. Um, yeah, I just did. I don't know. I don't know why I have this slide. I guess I mentioned uh, curiosity. Curiosity, uh, this is Dr. Fitzgerald. I think she probably said this last year. To her, curiosity is the most important element of physician. And I, I, mean, I don't know that I disagree. It requires that you keep asking yourself questions when you don't know or you don't understand, but really it's also asking others questions. So when you take care of patients, it's not just you. It's it's a whole ideally team of people, but sometimes you're the one in charge and so you've got to keep asking questions. So when people question, when you don't understand some recommendation or something someone else tells you about how to take care of a patient, you have to keep questioning that person and that understanding, if you will. Um, that's what you really need to know. You got to care. The third thing is listen to your patient. And you know who said this? I think somebody said it earlier. Say that again. Osler, do you mean? Or o- Osler? How do you how do you pronounce his name? Anybody know? You got this whole center here. Named after him, right? <laughs> this is really important. It's Osler. Osler. So uh, uh, listen to your patient. He or she is telling you the diagnosis. Now, 
William Osler is the father of <laughs> clinical of modern medicine. Um, he's the first chief of medicine at Hopkins in 1889. He started the first residency program, and he really is the person who started bedside teaching as a modality uh, for for people to learn about about medicine. Um, he started the first journal club, and this is he has a, so many quotes. He has books of quotes, but my favorite quote from him is. The, the greater the ignorance, the greater the dogmatism. I mean, and I think, you know, when you see and hear people be very dogmatic, I think your first thought should be, uh, maybe I ought to question what they're saying. Um, and that's, again, this is, I, I, I feel that, that that's sort of the difference between, I mean, you have to be confident in what you know and do, but there's a, a very fine line between that and being overconfident or cavalier. There's actually a science and an evidence base that listening to patients does actually help you make diagnoses. And you've probably heard me say this, but I'll tell you about a recent study done in a very large academic emergency department, which took 500 consecutive patients with a variety of ailments and then tried to figure out uh, after they were either admitted or sent home how actually the diagnoses were made in the 500 consecutive patients. So these are the results. This is 2011. Uh, <clears throat> basically, and lots of different tests were done, scans, x-ray, you know, the usual stuff that's done in emergency departments. Basically, they found that in 60% of the cases, if you just combine the history uh, along with the physical exam, you could make the diagnosis in 60% of the patients. If you added just a plain chest film and an e electrocardiogram, you could make 90% 90, 90 of the diagnoses. Only 6% of the diagnoses were made by anything more than that. So advanced imaging, CT, including CT scanning. Think about that, 6%. Think about how often, just think about that. If that is, matches up with your clinical experience of how often we do CT scans to make diagnoses. And so uh, all, if you, fewer than 10% of the diagnoses were not present by both history and physical, meaning you're not really going to miss much if you do a history and physical. Mostly that comes from the history. So actually listening is not only good for, you know, sort of the relationship, it's also good for making the diagnosis. Now what about your stethoscope? So that's another way to listen, right? I'm always talking about the stethoscope. What's the evidence that that actually works? So this is interesting stuff. This is measuring the ability of students across different levels in different schools. And it turns out that about if you take first and second year students, they get about 50% of the answers. You know, if you give them murmurs and stuff on a tape, or and they get about 50% of them correct. And as they go through third year, it actually goes up substantially, like into the 60, 65 percent overall. So it's a significant increase. But then fourth year, it doesn't change. And then residency, it still doesn't change. And then it, it, they did, there's about 100 physicians in this study that were actually several years out in practice the same. So no increase. The only increase is between second and third year medical school in the skills of, of auscultation. Now, that's with one exception. It's cardiology fellows. <laughs> now, um, now, why? You know, think about that, though. Does that, that's really depressing and discouraging. So the question to me is, how do you, what do you do about this? Like, how can you prevent this sort of decline in clinical skills that happens after the third year of medical school? Um, and I think it's interesting to think about. One of the things you got to understand is that learning is hard, number one. And I think learning is often misunderstood. Uh, it's by students and by teachers. And so when you think about learning, there's a lot of science of learn. There's a lot of new science about learning. It has to do with neurosciences and how, how long-term memory works. And a little bit of that, let me tell you a little bit about, you, you're probably familiar with this. Have anybody seen this learning pyramid? Right, these are the modalities of, if you think about the purpose of teaching, learning would be, would equal 
coding something that you've heard into long-term memory. So over here, you know, the, the neural pathways are kind of complicated. Working memory, short-term memory is sort of that's, is the stuff that I showed at the beginning. Five, six, seven words, you can hold it in short-term memory. Uh, you can also hold stuff in short-term memory to spit out on a test, you know, like within a few hours to a days. That's short-term memory. What, you really, what learning is, though, is you know, retention means coding into long-term memory. So as you go down this pyramid, right, the pinnacle is very abstract. It's listening to a lecture like this. You, have to, you retain 5%. <laughs> these, numbers are, these, these, num these numbers aren't necessarily that precise, but this is sort of, this is one person's work. As you go down and as you engage more of the senses in the learning, the retention rates go up. So at the bottom, to me, it's sort of like in, in grade school, it's like a field trip. And you go and you do stuff and you interact and you, you know, you, you, somebody shows you something, you get to try it. So that's the best, that's the, those are the best learning retention rates. The thing, so that makes sense. The thing I think that people don't understand, this is a book called Make It Stick, which has to do with what kinds of teaching actually, um, when you test learners over time, what kinds of teaching actually stick in their brain. And it turns out, rereading, which is like single-minded repetition or practice, that's like the most common strategy people use to learn. They, they go, they say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reread, reread, re I'm gonna do this thing over and over and over. It turns out that's like one of the least effective when you look at whether you retain the information over time. Secondly, most students, when you ask them, well, this was a good, what, was this a good class? Was this a bad class? They think learning, they, they, their, their assessment of whether they learn stuff actually has to do with whether it was easy or not. So think about that. So if it's, their learning is better when it's easy. It turns out if you measure learning by repeated assessments of whether they actually retain the information, it's not true. It's actually wrong. When it's easy, you don't remember it for a, for a long period of time. You do remember it, and you can remember it on a test, but you don't retain it. So learning, this author, this is Brown, says that you have to have actually certain desirable difficulties, which are impediments that make it harder to actually learn the material, make the learning stronger and more longer lasting. Meaning if you're distracted, he actually, I wish I had a clicker here, let me, hold on a second, I gotta go. You, 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 you basically need to try to learn stuff, the harder it is to learn something, the, the more likely it is it's gonna stick. And what he recommends is, what, is, is that you retrieve material from memory, you practice re retrieving material from memory over time. So you can't cram. Now I know that that's like really hard to do because when I was a medical student, I just crammed a lot. But I didn't learn, there's a lot of material that just went out of my brain. So I think that his studies actually suggest that you should space out retrieving information that you've learned, going back and trying to see if you can articulate it again, which helps you to overcome some forgetting. Actually mix it up, like study different subjects at the same time, because if you can actually make progress when you're studying different subjects at the, different, at the same time, then you actually make these, neuro, his theory is that you make connections in your brain that you wouldn't otherwise make. So the more you can vary the types of things you're studying, like multitasking, if you can do multitasking, even though it feels harder, that actually is more effective in terms of you learning stuff. The second paradox is testing improves learning. So the more, free, the more often you get tested, the more likely you are for, to retain the information. Now, of course, people don't like to be tested. You don't, but you don't have to be tested formally. You could test yourself. So I think if you can figure out ways to test yourself and test your own learning, that's probably going to result in retention. So bottom line is you've got to embrace the difficulty. The harder it is, the better it is. Okay? Now, you guys know what deliberate practice is? Deliberate practice as opposed to just non-specific practice, which would be the doing the same thing over and over. Have you ever done something over and over again and never gotten better at it? Has that ever happened to people? You try, you keep doing the same thing over and over and it doesn't, you don't improve. Auscultation. <laughs> 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 so, 
so, I, love, I love it. Yeah. Well, so what's it? Why, why, if you do something over and over again, why don't you get better? What do you think about that? Because if you keep doing, if you're doing something the wrong way, <laughs> you keep doing it the wrong way, it doesn't change. That's the difference between deliberate practice, which again, this is the Michael Jordan analogy, right? He used to dribble with his left hand. He's a right-hander a lot more than his right, his dominant hand. So because he would work on his weak spots, that's where he spent all the time. But that's not how learners prefer to do it. You prefer to do the stuff you like. We did a study about seven years ago of all the internal medicine programs, and we looked at what internal medicine residents read, what subjects they read. It turns out, when we looked, we, we tried to figure out whether they read about the subjects that they were weak in. It turns out, when we looked at their in-service scores, which gives you scores by like cardiology, pulmonary, all the different, they read the thing they're the best at already. <laughs> That's what they spend most of their time reading. So you want to read stuff and learn stuff that you already know. Why? Because it's easy. That's, that's why, again, this stuff by Brown is really, to me, opened my eyes. Because when you, when you think about something, that's, something that comes easy, easily, turns out in studies, doesn't last. The memories of that, what that learning is, doesn't endure. So deliberate practice takes uh, honest self-assessment meaning you got to know your own weaknesses. If you don't know your own weaknesses, you need to have a coach that tells you, look, you're not doing this right. Do it this way. Let me watch you do it again. Do, you know, that's deliver practice. So in my um, experience, I had, a, I had a very good coach when I was a third-year student. Um, and, oh, I forgot. I got another cliche here. I mean, another adage. It's unwise to be too sure of one's own wisdom. Kind of. Interesting. I think said another way, I like a shorter way, mine's shorter way, is uh, humility first, everything else second. So, and someone taught me this when I was a medical student. He's the, not the guy on the right. <laughs> the guy on the left, the guy on the left. The guy, so the guy, this is, when I was a third year student, I had a mentor, the, it's the guy on the left, Dr. Tierney, who really, I think he showed me that he made me believe that I could actually do uh, something that I didn't think I could do. I didn't believe in myself in some sense. And I think his inspiration and also his humility made me think, wow, I could do, I, I want to be like that person. Like, he was a really great role model for me and an extremely humble guy. And I just think this is so funny that he has this picture with this other guy. <laughs> this is not, not humble. And you think of humility. He's not the guy that comes to mind, right? He's the decider. So learn, learn from your mistakes is the, is the fourth adage. Now, to learn from your mistakes, you have to acknowledge them, OK? So for me, I'll tell you about a few mistakes I've made. I just listed a couple there. One, when I, I, I told a woman once she had lung cancer because her CT scan had a big necrotic mass with a bunch of lymph nodes right next to it draining into the mediastinum. Well, it turns out it was a fungus ball, and she was devastated. Of course, when we biopsied it, it wasn't cancer. Um, so that stuck in my mind. Uh, I also told this woman that I took, she was in my clinic for a long time, very anxious woman. She had a chronic abdominal pain. I kept telling her it was irritable bowel syndrome, which you see this all the time, right? But until she went to another doctor, and she got her gallbladder taken out, all her symptoms went away. And I had taken care of her for like two years in clinic. The third thing I would say, I remember, this is so clear in my mind, I had a guy who I admitted to this car, CCU who of a small heart attack. He had very young children. He had a young teenage son. Uh, he had six kids, actually. The youngest was a teenager. And I remember telling the kid, the kids, that his dad would be okay because they were very worried about him. And I wasn't that worried about him. And I said, absolutely, he's going to be fine. He looked fine. Of course, that day, that night, the next night, he had like extended his infarct and died. And so, and I was just, you know, they were devastated. Of course, I told them he was going to be fine. These things, I remember them like they were yesterday. All three happened in my internship. Okay, that's 1989. Okay, so I think if you, so, 
and there are many others. I'm just telling you the ones in my internship. And I think that the point is you, you, you have to think about what you, I think you have to think about your mistakes if you're ever going to grow. So I, I sort of tried to think about the lessons I learned from those three. Tissue's the issue. You've heard, I don't know if you've, you've, hopefully, have you ever heard that said? Hopefully that's been said. Tissue's the issue. You don't ever tell anyone they have cancer unless you see the bi has the biopsy with cancer in it. Um, when you don't know, you, something like, I didn't know this guy's father was going to be okay. I just wanted to make him feel better. <laughs> then he died, right? I mean, it, and so I think it's better to just say you don't know. And, and then be uncomfortable. Um, the third thing is don't judge a book by its cover. People who are anxious actually can get sick with other diseases too. Just because they're anxious doesn't mean whenever they come in with anxiety that, that anxiety is the cause. Okay? Um, and I think, you know, bottom line here is you have to face up to your mistakes. So I, we had a fa I had a family meeting with this family, this guy, Mr. Valdez the six kids, his wife, of the first thing the son said to me was, you said he was going to be fine. <laughs> and and um, it's hard. I, it's, but you got to learn. I think you have to. This is how we all learn. And I think these are the things that form you. These are the things that I remember. So this, don't believe everything you hear or read in EMR. This, I don't even need to explain this. That's just another, I'm not going to say anything more about it. I'm going to go into the next one, which is watch yourself like a hawk. This is what I mean about, uh, you know, sort of learning from your mistakes. Um, this is, anybody know what kind of hawk this is? It's is a red tail hawk. Easy, right? I gave you them all. This is like the perfect colors. It's the most common, the most common hawk in North America. You're, you can see these all over the place in Yolo County. It's a beautiful Beautiful bird. Um, and they're up on the telephone lines. Um, so watch yourself like a hawk has to do with something I'm going to call emotional intelligence. And I think that this is another part of clinical functioning and interpersonal functioning that I think is under um, emphasized. But EQ is the ability to understand and interpret and respond to emotions. It actually turns out a lot of people think it's more important than IQ. Um, and IQ is a fixed trait, as you know, relatively fixed, a stable cognitive ability is pretty stable. Emotional intelligence can be learned. Um, the four elements of emotional intelligence are self-awareness, how you perceive yourself, uh, how you sort of monitor yourself, meaning if you have this idea that you want to lash out at someone or say something, I don't know, cruel, you, 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 you have an ability to perceive that and then stop yourself, kind of like a little bit of, a little bit like a super ego would, but basically it's to monitor your own impulses, okay? This third thing is social awareness, and the fourth thing is relationships. This has to do with how you communicate non-verbally often. So these are the four elements of emotional intelligence. When you look at studies of how people do and how, how successful they are in the workplace, no matter what profession. Actually, this has been done over 500 professions. It turns out that people who have high emotional intelligence do better uh, in almost every profession, especially leaders. Uh, it's also associated with greater physical health, mental health, and personal relationships. And so basically, emotional intelligence is something that people need to become more aware of and understand how critical it is to uh, their success. So I mentioned earlier, you're, everybody has triggers, things that, that push, you know, buttons that push your buttons, they make you angry, they make, whatever they make you, whatever emotion is invoked by certain situations, if you're ruled by those emotions, sometimes your functioning in a, in a team environment or a social environment is really impaired. If I think of my years, 17, 18 years as a residency program director here at the University of Texas, the biggest problems I had with residents were problems with this, okay? If, and I want you to think about this for a second. Have you ever seen interns or residents who like get mad and yell at nurses? You ever seen that? Anybody ever seen that? I mean, 
What do you think about that? I think it's, this, it's, it's amazing to me how people do this. It's so un... It, it's, it, you're going to sink yourself. If, when you become a resident, the first rule is you don't piss off the nurses. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. or what, they, they, They're there. They've been there for decades. You're like a transient. You come in and you, and I'm serious though, people come in and they would be, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And they would say something really, you know, inflammatory to the nurses. Well, what do you think happens? Oh, the other nurses, the whole floor knows, the whole, everybody, you know, they all, do you think they don't affect the, the, what happens to that doctor? It's incredible, but it's so obvious. But I think what it is, is this is emotional intelligence. You have to realize what, if you let your emotions rule your interactions, you're going to sink yourself. And so, like I said, all of the tru- if I ever had a problem resident in my, all of my experience as a program director, it was never because they didn't know enough. It was because they didn't know about their emotions. They weren't able to control them and they weren't able to actually interact with people. So that's, I mean, those are, those come into the realm of what we call professional interaction in some way. But I think actually this, there's a book I'll, I'll give you at the end which talks about emotional intelligence. I think it's a, it's worth learning about. Um, let's see. Oh yes, don't forget to breathe. So in a code, first take your own pulse. That means, and I, literally, I mean, when you're in a code situation or a conflict, this is like the emotional intelligence part. If you take your own pulse, it tends to actually slow down a bit, and that actually helps. I think the other thing you can do in a situation where you have conflict, like with the nurse, is something I, we call get up on the balcony. You get up on the balcony means you pause and you look down. Sometimes when you're on the balcony and you look down at the dance floor, you, in, when you're on the dance floor, you, all you can see is the person in front of you, right? You're going to step on their toe. You're going to you know, fall over them. You think it's a crowded dance floor, but you get up in the balcony, you see you're the only couple there sometimes, meaning you don't see it all. You don't see the whole perspective unless you step back. This is part of emotional intelligence, too. Pausing and trying to step out of a situation, try to get out of your emotions to see the whole picture. Um, same thing in a code. I, I, you have to... You have to slow down. There's always time. So this is ancient emotional intelligence from Buddha. It's better to conquer yourself than to win a thousand battles. Then the victory is yours. It can't be taken from you, not by the angels, demons, heaven, or hell. So this is all about battling yourself in some way, I think, your own emotions. That's, that's, what, that's what I think, le- that's what I feel is, is you know, what you're going to try to do to get these are this is tree pose. These are my two boys doing yoga, sort of without unknowingly. So um, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, this is what I did with that woman who was anxious, right? Who had the cholecystitis, the col- coleothiasis when I thought she was anxious. Um, don't judge, but I can't help it. You know, we can't help it. We always judge people. <laughs> I mean, if you look at what, the way uh, your mind works and the science of cognition, people always make judgments, whether they want to or not. So I think that if you read and you, there's an there's a, 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 a economist, Daniel Kahneman, who studied his whole career on how the mind works and what biases it, it, it naturally assumes and basically your mind is designed to take shortcuts which involve biases because it it allows you to make quick decisions without kind of having to wrestle through every single decision that that you make so uh, the problem is it often results in errors so you guys know the availability bias or heuristic have you guys heard of heuristics heuristics are shortcuts right that your mind takes to try to make quick decisions. So the one that I like best, there are many of these, is that if you've seen something recently, or if it was particularly memorable, you tend to think that everything else like that, because it's in your brain, is, it, it, it is going to be the same thing. So you see a patient with chest pain, they turn out to have a dissection in the emergency room. Then the next 20 patients you see with dissection, and with chest pain, you think 
have a dissection. Well, what's the problem with that logic? <laughs> Say it again, Kelly. Yes, the prevalence of dissection is still really low. It doesn't go up just because you saw a patient with a dissection. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why we need to learn about diseases and their prevalence and understand, but our mind, like I told you with the, with the lady with the, you know, with, the abdom with the chronic abdominal pain and anxiety that had you know, she had symptomatic biliary colic, which I missed. So of course for a while I kept thinking, oh, is this biliary colic? It's got to be biliary colic. It's abdominal pain. That's not, that's again, that's, I just, you need to be aware of it. You can't change that, but that's how your mind works. Um, that hassle bias, I tell one other story. This is a woman I took care of again, a very anxious woman. She, was, she came to my clinic every week, every two weeks, always with lots of different types of pain. Shoulder pain, leg pain, back pain, always pain. She was very anxious. She always called at night. I used to have Tuesday night call. We divided our calls up by the day of the week, so I had Tuesday nights. So uh, when, when you, what, what we would do is you would take phone calls for all the patients in the practice. So on Tuesday nights, that's what she'd always call. So I would always look forward to talking to her every Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, one night she called, and she's about a 65-year-old woman, and she had chest pain. And again, I thought, chest pain, I, it's, she's got pain everywhere, she's so, you know. So I said, well, does it feel like, you know, I just asked her the, you know, the number of questions that, you know, it's musculoskeletal, it sounds like it's, 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 I wanted to believe it was musculoskeletal and it was like midnight and I wanted to go to sleep. She had an MI and died that night. This is, I t I'd taken care of her for years. This is when I was a faculty member. I'd taken care of her for years, six, seven, eight years. I felt horrible. But what happened was, again, I was influenced by a couple things what we call hassle bias. It's the middle of the night. You don't want to get up. You don't want to wake up. It's easier for me to assume this chest pain is musculoskeletal. I don't even want to go into the details, but I have to bring it up because we always make these quick assumptions. We have to. I just want you to be aware of them because if you're aware of them, I think you're more likely to catch yourself when you do it. Um, so, so metacognition is what I'm talking about here, which is thinking about your own thinking. And if you think about not just what you're learning, the content, but actually how you think, the more you do that, I think you're more likely to, again, be able to not trip up like this. Now, it requires, again, really reflecting on your weaknesses and your mistakes and spending time thinking about them. Um, our minds in a way, the bottom, they do play tricks on us, and that's because we have to, they have to do that to function. Think about when you learned to drive, when you first learned to drive, how hard it was to, like, make a right turn and signal and, you know, to, you know how many, how much effort, mental effort went to that, and you were, like, struggling. Now think about yourself driving now. You don't even, you've got music blaring, you've got every, you got, and you're, and it's, oh, it's automatic, right? So automatic, the automatic, those automatic thinkings and patterns of think, that's how our brain works. It has to work that way. And it, it, we just couldn't expend all that effort by, you know, sp you know, we've learned and we've automated that pathway, if you will. But that's what happens with, when we make decisions, too. I, I really recommend this guy's book, Daniel Kahneman, which talks about thinking, because it totally debunks the way you think your brain works. This guy won the Nobel Prize for economics. It's a, it's a great book. Um, let's, um, now, and I think your mind, again, things aren't always what they seem. And it, it's true with vision, with hearing, with all kinds of thinking. Um, my next thing is look out the window not in the mirror. Now, so I just want to mention one reason to look out the window is this. There's beautiful things out in the world, right? You don't want to miss them. The second reason is um, if you think about leadership, and I think I, I love leader. I love Jim Collins. He's a Stanford Business School professor. He writes about leadership. He writes about he studied about 500 Fortune 500 companies and figured out kind of, he tried to profile the best leaders versus the worst ones, defined by 
how successful the companies were. So basically what he found was that the great leaders, what, what happens when you look in the mirror, you see yourself, right? When you look out the window, you see actually what's going on around you. Um, and his thesis is that great leaders, they look out the window to credit others when things go well. But they look in the mirror to take the blame when things go badly. This is like Lincoln. That's, the, that's exactly the way he led, if you read about Abraham Lincoln. The weaker leaders, they look out the window to blame everyone else. Uh, and, but they always look in the mirror to take credit when things go well. It's sort of like Patton. Patton is, you guys know who Patton is? You may know who Patton is. He's a general. <laughs> so the point is, when he looked at these companies, he actually could discriminate the leaders. The great leaders were the ones that gave everyone else credit, not themselves. So again, look out the window, not in the mirror, if, 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 you, wanna, if you wanna be a great leader. Um, I just like this quote. You anybody know who said this? Uh, he was a president. <laughs> That's a Truman. Truman. Uh, he, was a, he was a very humble president. Take risks. This is, I think I have two more, two more adages here. Take risks. Get out of your comfort zone. This is, this is, uh, this is my wife in 1982. This is when we met. So I, I was 19 years old. And I was studying electrical engineering, and I met, I met my wife. She told me this, what, what, why are you doing this, like staying up all night in this computer lab, doing this crazy stuff? You don't seem to really love that. Like, uh, why, why don't you do something you love versus a job? Well, and I know it takes a long time, but what are you afraid of? That's, so I think that, that and, and so, Long story short, I mean, I, I switched from being an engineer and went to medical school and all that. I, I won't talk about that. The point is, I think you have to get out of your, sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone to sort of achieve something greater. And a lot of times we want to be in our comfort zone. That's why the learning stuff I told you about, people like classes that are easy, but they don't learn anything in them. They don't learn as much. That's the, so it's the hard stuff. It's the hard stuff. So, she, so anyway, this is how many years ago is that? That's a lot of years. 30, 30 something years. Well, she's, she's still lovely and amazing. Um, that, so take, also take risks. I think the other place to take risks is really to benefit your patients and your friends in situations that are tough. So I think, you know, most patients you see, they're suffering. One of the things that they're losing is control over their lives. Or they're losing the battle to cancer. Or they're in pain. These things are what, you know, and, and then, you know, people have their personal pain, right? From relationships, from whatever's happened to them. I think rather than running away from them, which again is certainly what I tended to do, I think that you, what you can do, or what I've learned to do or try to do is to just be there and acknowledge that it's difficult. Sometimes with patients, his family, it was not easy. It's, but we always like to make it easy, make it sound easy and sugarcoat and make, make people feel better, but it doesn't really work. And sometimes things are just bad. So you just have to acknowledge those things and be there for people. I think that's a huge gift for people. Um, and just showing up is enough sometimes. Whether you say anything. I used to, I, I remember I went to that patient I told you about that died that I told his family would be fine. I went to his funeral. I remember thinking, I, I asked my wife, you know, I, should I go to this? I don't want to go. I'm, I'm embarrassed. You know, like, well, I'm going to go there and show my face in this. And she's like, you have to go. You don't have to say, I said, what am I going to say? You don't have to say anything. You got to go. You know, so I went and I didn't really say anything, but it was fine. They want, they were happy I was there. Even though, you know, again, just, you know, it's just some situations are hard. You just got to go there. You got to be there. You got to show up. Um, and that's, that's often enough. You don't have to say something profound. 
I think this is my last kind of idea here. From the mouth of babes comes great wisdom. Um, so I was just going to, this is something my son said. He's a first grader, and he won this Yolo County art <laughs> contest. And he said, animals need water to live. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes the great thing about children is they tell it, they tell it like it is. This is my daughter. When she graduated from college, she graduated from Harvard. This is my son, John. He's seven years old at the time. She said, John, thank you so much for coming to my graduation. He said, JJ, that's the Chinese for big sister. It's so boring. <laughs> I can't, I can't. I, he, it's, she said, but didn't you like it? It was Amy Poehler spoke at the grad. It was so boring. <laughs> so, 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 that's what, that's, but I think that's the way kids are. They say, you know, they don't, they don't put anything on it. It's the, that's what we lose, you know, and it's, it's sweet. Um, this is my son John's graduation from kindergarten. I remember at the time, I thought, wow, why, this is kind of weird, we're having a graduation from kindergarten? <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know. But I, I look back on it now, and what I didn't know is that it, it would be his only graduation. Um, he, and so I just wanted to say a few words about being a parent. I have three kids, and people ask me a lot, well, what's a good time to have children? You know, how did you do, you know, my wife's a physician, it's hard, you know? We had my daughter, she's 26 years old there. I was an intern, it was October, my internship when she was born. My wife was a third year student on CT surgery. That's when she was born. So it's hard to have kids. And I don't think there's any good time. And I think you just, but like other things in life, sometimes you, it just happens, or you, you can't plan for these things. But it's, it's, it's something that I didn't expect to be like such a gift. It's been, it's been an incredible gift. It's been an incredible challenge. You know, um, we didn't plan them. I, my middle son, his name is Paul. He's on the left. We planned him, but the other two were surprises. <laughs> well, two doctors, two doctors. Man. It's amazing, you know? So, um, um, so I, I think sometimes you have to take what life brings. Um, you know, I'm a, I, I like this, making predictions is difficult, especially when it comes to the future. You know who said that? Um, this is Yogi Berra. You guys know who Yogi Berra is? You may even know who Yogi Berra is. Probably don't know Yogi Berra. It's like, a what? Baseball, right? He's a catcher for the Yankees. That's very good. But he said a lot of fun things. I like this one. Um, but I think the point I make is that it's hard. Sometimes you never know what's going to happen to you. This is my family in 2010. My three kids. Dr. Fancher took this picture, actually. We were at Dos Coyotes. And um, um, this is my family last year, four years later. We don't have my son, John. The, the youngest, because he died in an accident. And um, I think my point, the reason I wanted to bring that up is that I think sometimes you just don't know what's going to happen to you. And I don't think we appreciate that. Certainly I didn't. Um, this is a picture of my, my son, Paul, the one that he looks like a bandito there, robber, um, and my wife. And that's where, this is near where my son died. There's a run there that's named after him. And if you can see, it says, it says John John's Way. It's a ski run in, uh, in Soda Springs. And so I just think that for me, I think being here and what I would tell you is that, again, I started with this, I'll end with this, is that I'm only here because of others. And, and I think all of us are only here because of, of others and what they've done. In, in my case, my, the, the others and all of us include my parents. I'll show my parents there. Um, my brother, John, who was a very gentle, kind soul, taught me a lot, but he didn't live very long. I think we don't appreciate a lot of times what we have. 
And so my final kind of comment would be, just don't waste the time you have. Make sure you put your talents and passions to good use, uh, because sometimes you just never know what, what can happen. Um, I think that's the last slide I have. Um, Oh, I have some references here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I do. I'm not. I have, books, for me, books have to be short or I can't read them. I have like a, a short, short attention span. Teaching, so I, all these books I'd recommend. Teaching and learning. Make It Stick is a great book for any teacher, any learner. It's only 200 pages, large print. Um, <laughs> Leaders, uh, Good to Grave by Jim Collins is, is a, again, a great book that is two, 250, large print. Um, Crucial Conversations is a great book about relationships, similar uh, uh, birds. I like the Merlin Bird app from Cornell. It can show you how to identify birds. Um, I like uh, Life's Rich Pageant. That's my REM recommendation for album. And I already told you about Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow from Daniel Kahneman. Um, and I think that's my last slide, so I'm happy to take any uh, questions if there are any. Oh, that's my son on Halloween. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Longer than 20 minutes, so so I'm sorry about that. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Henderson? Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Um, Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Neha, and I'm one of the interns um, in the Internal Medicine Residency Program. Uh, thank you so much for having us, and thank you so much, Dr. Henderson, for a really amazing um, talk right now. I think my big question is, um, you know, we come into residency with so much enthusiasm. We start medical school with so much enthusiasm. Yeah. And at every junction, yeah. you have, you come in with a lot of energy after every rotation, it kind of comes back after that shelf exam or what, yeah. what it may be. Yeah. And then it kind of feels like you might get into this to write. You might get a little bit more comfortable. You might kind of just go through the motions yeah. Yeah. and not really have that oomph that you once did when you started. Um, so my question is, my biggest fear is just having that in my career going forward. I never want to be comfortable. I never want to be in that comfort zone. Um, I guess in your residency and throughout your career, what do you maybe wish you would have done earlier? Or what did you learn that really kind of made you think, how do I change my goals going forward? How do I find the time to reflect on mistakes I may have made or things I would have learned? Well, I, I'd say two things. It's a great question. I think that um, I wish that I think the biggest thing is you have to take time to think about what you want not what others want and what makes you tick not what you think others are you know that your parents want or what you think is right or the thing you're supposed to do i think it's what makes you tick and i think a lot of times the problem with medical education is it's too hard there's too many hoops to jump through bridges to cross that you know all these things to get there right you don't even you don't even think about why you're there you know, that you, you're there, you do all these things, you accomplish all these things, and you get there, but you haven't thought about what it is. And for me, I was not in medicine. I mean, I, I, as I, I didn't tell the whole story, but I mean, I was going to be an engineer. I grew up in Silicon Valley. Everyone in my work for Apple Computer, I was going to be an engineer. I would have been fine. It would have been fine. It would have it been fine. Right? I mean, that's what, that's, what, that's, what I think, that's what I think my wife taught me. Bef I mean, before she was, you know, you just like, what are you doing? Like, you're wasting it. It, what, it seems like you're not that happy. So I think that you, I, I think you have to think about what makes you tick. Meaning, if you don't, if, if, if there was a storm, right, or an earthquake, right, and, and I don't know, or the economy changed, or some, some terrible tragedy, would you still want to get up and do what you do? For me, I say yes. I've been through a lot. I let, you know, but people have, I, I, I think it's a wonderful, what we do is incredible. It's incredible. 
where we are with people, how we can be in their lives. But that's just, I'm, I can't convince you of that, right? You have to, it has to be in you. And I think, but, but you do have to, what I, I think I didn't realize was sometimes we waste so much time doing things that don't really help us. Like I think reflection or, or I don't know, yoga or something that makes you think about why you're here and what you really want to do and what really has meaning to you. That's important work to do. And I think that the thing is, there's time to do it now. You know, when we were in residence, um, we had a little baby, you know, we, uh, but I, I was thankful that my program director let us have call on different nights. I didn't see my wife for, I don't know, a long time because we took care of our daughter. That was hard. But I loved my job too, actually. I, I actually loved it, but it was hard. And I screwed up. I mean, that was just a few glimpses of them. But I think I was cut out for it. I don't know if everybody's cut out for it. You know what I mean? It's, uh, I don't know, I'm not helping you, Neha, but. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I guess, you just sort of prompted me to think about something, which is that I think we don't think about the long view. We're just thinking about the next year or two. But realize a healthy young woman like yourself, Neha, right? You're going to live to be on average 90. That was the average. That's the average. I'm not saying you will. God willing, you do. But that's the average. How many years is that? That's 60 years of working or 50. Let's just say 50 years of working. I mean, you, you're, you, I think people don't think they think they're going to have kids. I mean, I, 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 I never thought ahead. I didn't think about how long it is. And now for me, I don't have, you know, my kids were 15 years apart. I had kids in my house for 25 straight years. <laughs> 25, but now they're gone. It's just me and my wife. It's really lonely, actually. Honestly, it's really lonely. And what I have is my profession. I'm glad I chose it because I do love it. But if you don't, I agree. I mean, it's really hard. But you're let, let's say you go, you have family, whatever then it's over. If you're 45, you're 50, you got 25, 30 more years, what do you do? You do something that you don't like? Think about how many people are discouraged and disillusioned in medicine. It's a huge problem. In, in California, right, 20% of California physicians are just thinking of retiring early. They just don't love what they do. I, I'm not, I want to oversimplify it. It's really unfortunate. But I think following your bliss somehow, if that's possible, yeah, that's that's the, maybe the solution if there is one. Um, uh, and then take those ti the time off you have, that day off every week, and use it to like, you know, do some of this stuff, whatever that work is or whatever that, you know, whatever makes you tick. I don't know. It's a long answer, a short question. Sorry. <laughs> Any, anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Gina. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. I'm so happy I came. Uh, um, I'm Medina, one of the residents. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I guess it's on. I guess my question is uh, humility. How do you, I know you, you can learn humility, learn how to be humble. How would I, how would you do it? Like how do you, just you, teaching you, med students, how do you bring yeah. it up or how do you teach them? <laughs> wow, um, The balance between being yeah. confident, yeah. confident enough, yeah. and then also being humble yeah. enough. I yeah. never, Yeah. You know, well, you already have it, Medina, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't, it, teaching humility, wow, I think some people have to have it, have to have it um, happen to them, meaning they have to be humbled by their, their experiences and by um, having things not go their way, by making bad decisions, by that to me, medicine, every time I've said this to you before, I'm humbled every time I see a patient on the wards. I'm humbled how much I don't know. Because every time I think I know something, a patient surprises me. And I don't know how to teach that humility. I think it, it's where you come from, maybe. But I think if you t listen to people with experience, like Dr. Tierney, I think he's the smartest guy in the world. I really admired him. He's extremely humble. Dr. Fitzgerald, I mean, we know medicine and people are complicated. It's not straightforward, no matter how much you know. I mean, I, but I don't know how to teach humility. I don't know. And I think, again, because of that tunnel I talked about, the jumping through hoops and all that to get to medical school, you lose perspective about what the world is like for most people. 
I don't, that's not how, it, it's not, you know, we, we make a ton of money. I don't care what special you go into. It's not like the other 99%. There's the people living in the real world. It's hard. That to me is, that's one of the problems with, again, pre-medical education. If it, if it gets you out of the world, of the, the, the 90, the, the, the society, right? I mean, you think that this is, you know, that, that it's this way because you're surrounded by people that are all in that world. That, that, so to me, the solution is to get out of this world, to get into the real world. But you, you know, you guys, I mean, that's why you need to see patients and see patients out there, you know, out of this, outside of the, sometimes in the hospital, I think we get kind of a warped view too. Um, I mean, I work in the hospital. I like the hospital, but I'm just saying it's, it's the area of mass. Matt? Yeah, um, thanks so much for talking, Dr. Yeah, Henderson. Man. You've had a really significant impact in my life. And I know you, just me saying that, that there's so many others who feel that yeah. same way, where you've really uh, made a difference or a course change in their life. And my question is, how, how do you think we can best influence people going forward? How can we um, be kind of an impact, impactful catalyst for other people? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's showing you don't realize how big of an impact you have as a resident. You guys who are about to become residents, every word you say, a student is looking up at you going, okay, I, that, I heard that. I mean, I don't, is that, is that the way I'm supposed to be? Is that the way I'm, or, you know, so, so to me, the way, that's the wonderful thing about education is I guess it's a it's a burden too. you have to watch what you say because it makes a huge impact on people and and you guys I think going forward just watch yourself like a hawk right make sure that you live up to what we're talking about those professional standards um, because you have a huge impact but the students and residents they don't learn from the people like me really if you think about it you drill down they learn from their residents the students learn from the residents. They spend all this time with them. They're the biggest influence. And you will be residents, so you will be that influence. It's huge, huge. The, um, yeah, I, so um, I think it's the way you carry yourself. It's the way you behave. That's how you pass it on. But thank you for the compliment, Matt. I, I, it's an honor to give, you know, to give something back to people if they carry it forward. Any last questions? Okay. So I think we'll close out. Thank you again so much, Dr. Henderson, for Thank coming. You. We'll